So welcome everyone to today's lecture. Um, we have to switch a little bit now in these slides. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it to you to make sense of that switch uh, in, in light of the upcoming exam. Uh, I will not be discussing the trinomial model, the Monte Carlo model, and uh, the finite differences model uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the trinomial model is basically the same as the binomial model, uh, just with trinomial states, three straight uh, states um, the underline can take. Monte Carlo simulation, I've already um, explained to you the um, basic idea behind Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation is always the idea in statistics that you have a distribution, you simulate from that distribution, and this can actually be quite cumbersome in statistics to come up with a, an algorithm to simulate from a given distribution. But Monte Carlo simulation means you simulate observations under a given distribution, and then in this case, you do what? You simulate paths from the underlying stochastic process. Actually, I think I have, uh, I have uh, a plot here, yeah? For example, these are three simulated paths of a geometric Brownian motion. You plug them into the option payout profile, and then you have three potential, three simulated option um, payouts and then you simulate, you estimate the option price. That's quite simple. So that's Monte Carlo simulation. And last but not least, we'll have finite differences. I'll skip that as well. I'll give you the basic nugget, the, the nugget of information you need to understand this. Finite differences. Go back to the black scholes model. What is the black scholes model based on? It's based on the black scholes differential, partial differential equation. A partial differential equation is an equation where you have partial derivatives in it of a function. Partielle Ableitung. What is a derivative? A derivative is the differential quotient. The limit of the difference. It's, it's the differential quotient here. In Deutsch kennen Sie das aus der Analysis, was die Ableitung, das ist der Differentialquotient. Also der Grenzwert für zum Beispiel f von x minus f von, an der Stelle a geteilt durch x minus a. Wenn der Punkt a gegen x geht, wo geht die Funktion hin? Das ist Grenzwert. Und die Ableitung. In other words, you might remember this from high school, to estimate, to approximate the derivative of a function, you can use a triangle. Yeah, you take two points, you link those two points, you get the tangent to the function at a point x or at a point a, and the tangent, the slope of the tangent, die Steigung der Tangente, is the first derivative. So what do you do to approximate the partial derivatives in the partial differential equation? You do the same. You use triangles. You use what is then called a finite difference. Die Überlegung ist eigentlich relativ simpel. Sie müssen die Ableitung approximieren. Und Ableitungen sind per Definition Differentialquotienten. Also nehmen Sie nicht den Differentialquotienten im Grenzwert, sondern Sie nehmen den Differenzenquotienten, nämlich einfach zwei Punkte, Differenz zwischen den Funktionswerten geteilt durch die Differenz zwischen x1 und x2. Dann haben Sie ja letztlich die beiden Seiten, ne, die Steigung des Dreieckes der beiden Seiten. Und das Ergebnis ist die Methode der finiten Differenzen. In the method of finite differences, you substitute the partial, der partial derivatives using finite differences. And if you take, you don't need this, because as I said, this will not be part of the exam, but if you take uh, a look at the slides later on with finite differences, these are finite differences. You can take, for example, forward differences, backward differences, central symmetric differences. And actually, it's quite simple to understand. Look at this. It's two points of the function, one forward and the current one, divided by the difference in x. Backward difference is you take x, or oh, no, f, i, and you take 
f i minus 1, so you take one step back from the function value and the difference in x, and the symmetric difference is just around this point where you want to approximate the derivative. It's a very simple method of solving a partial differential equation, substituting the derivatives by using differences, finite differences. And because this is an approximation, it's not uh, true in the limit. Uh, you call this finite differences, finite differenzen. It's commonly used in numerical analysis and also in engineering, because in engineering and in mathematical physics, you have partial differential equations everywhere. If you want to calculate any any behavior of material, you will need partial differential equations. And in many cases in engineering, you have to do this quickly. You need speed to approximate these partial differential equations, and then you use finite differences. And then it's very simple. You solve the partial differential equation, and again, you get an approximate solution to the black scholes model. So take a look at that. It's also explained in MATLAB. Why am I not talking about this here? Because I'm running out of time. I want to talk about something else for obvious reasons. And the third reason is this is also done in computational finance at the master's level. Um, I'll talk about computation and I, I'll, I'll talk about Monte Carlo simulation and finite differences a lot in the module uh, computational finance in the master's degree. So if you miss it out here, and if you go on uh, to the master's level, you, you will have a second chance to hear me talk about finite differences in Monte Carlo simulation. And there is not too much theory to it, apart from the fact that these are commonly used mathematical models to simulate stochastic processes and to approximate um, partial differential equations. Klar geworden? Also das ist nicht die Gründe, warum ich das jetzt skippe. Das ist klar, es kommt noch mein Master dran. Ähm, ist auch ein bisschen mathematischer, ein bisschen anspruchsvoller. Ähm, bei den partiellen Differentialgleichungen mit den finiten Differenzen überlegen Sie es ganz simpel. Sie haben eine Ableitung und wenn Sie einfach in der, in der Differentialgleichung, wo die Ableitungen auftauchen, wenn Sie einfach alle Ableitungen durch letztlich die Steigungsdreiecke ersetzen, haben Sie keine Probleme mehr. Ne? Wird alles sehr einfach. Und bei der Monte Carlo Simulation unterstellen Sie irgendeinen stochastischen Prozess. Sie haben eine Option, das hatte ich vergessen zu sagen, eine Option, die exotisch üblicherweise ist. Für eine Plain Vanilla Option brauchen Sie keine Monte Carlo Simulation. Da haben Sie Black Scholes. Sie brauchen Monte Carlo Simulation nur dann, wenn Black Scholes keine Lösung mehr liefert. Und das ist immer dann der Fall, wenn die Option zu kompliziert wird. Und dann simulieren Sie einfach 100.000 Werte aus dem Underline, setzen die 100.000 Werte ein in Ihr Optionsprofil und ermitteln den Erwartungswert, den Durchschnitt, und dann ist das Ihr geschätzter Optionspreis. Gut. Fragen dazu? Any questions? Okay. Then let's come to something which is more relevant and I think some of you who have already taken the class uh, with Professor Schumacher on derivatives might, might recognize some of the things we'll talk about. Hedging strategies for selective risk types. You've seen futures, you've seen forwards, you've seen options, but apart from a very distinct feeling of how to use these derivatives for hedging, you don't know how to use them. So what we'll do is we'll have a long position in an underline and we want to hedge it. We want to come up with an option or derivative strategy to minimize risk and ideally to reduce risk to zero. So what do we do? We'll start with a one-to-one -one short hedge. Um, we have to cover an existing long position, a spot position. So that is, we, for example, we bought a stock and we are now the proud owner of a stock of Deutsche Bank. Interestingly, so many people own stocks of Deutsche Bank. I have no explanation for that why. People are complaining a lot because they invested all their, in my, at least in my, with my friends, they all invested in Deutsche Bank stocks. I have no idea why. Um, so let's assume you are the proud owner of that stock and 10 years back you decide to hedge your position, hopefully. We'll start with a one-to-one -one short hedge. Some notation is necessary. S is the time at which the short position 
and we are using the future contract, was established. T is the time at which the futures contract is settled. Capital T is the maturity. KT, again, from the German Kassa course, is the spot price. And FS is the forward or futures price. Now, if we first neglect interest on incoming and outgoing payments in the margin account, because you know that with a futures contract, you usually have a margin account. You need to pay into your margin account. And everything that is in your margin account under the premise of non-zero interest rate should give you a positive return on your, on your money uh, in the margin account. So the profit loss position of a one-to-one -one short hedge is what? KT, we can sell the spot position, the long position in the underlying. We have previously paid KS for the long position. So the difference between the two spot prices is our profit or loss on the spot position minus we'll have a short hedge. So we'll go short with the future. So we will get minus FT. We'll have to pay minus FT and we'll have received plus FS when establishing, when opening the short futures position. Very simple. So go long in the underlying, go short in the future. As you know, a future is a linear derivative. It's a linear asset with a linear price structure. So later on, there will be no big surprise that if you earn one euro with your underlying, you will lose one euro with your future and the other way around, vice versa. If you change it a little bit, it's FS minus KS minus FT minus KT. And if you remember the section, the chapter on futures, the difference between the spot and the futures price is called the basis. And then we'll have basis as BS minus BT. So for T smaller than capital T, the basis BT is stochastic. Hence, we will not get a perfect hedge. However, we have the convergence of the futures price to the current stock price, meaning that the basis will vanish if we come closer to the expiration of the futures contract. So B capital T is zero. So in the end, the profit or loss is BS. The basis at the moment at which we have hedged our position. So if we can observe a positive basis can also be negative. We will fix our profit at the level of the current basis. Now, it completely offsets any chances of earning money, but we are also safe in the sense that we cannot lose money. You know, quite simple. If always we earn one euro and lose one in the short position and vice versa, well, there's no chance of earning money. That's clear. So this is the perfect short hedge using futures, um, future short and uh, long in the underlying, um, and it depends on the current level of the basis, the difference between the future and the spot price. If the underlyings do not match, we'll get what we call a cross hedge risk, cross hedging risk, meaning that you have the Deutsche Bank stock as the underlying and you're using a future on Commerzbank. The underlines do not match. They should be correlated. You might want to try this, but this will induce a cross-hedging risk. Problem is, in some cases, you will not have derivatives on your underlying. So if there are no futures traded on Deutsche Bank stock, well, you might be forced to resort to Commerzbank futures because you, it, it's as close as it can get. Now, in a long hedge, you use um, not um, you use a future um, to hedge a not yet existing but planned spot position. You know that you want to buy in the future. This could be something, for example, in the agricultural business where you think, okay, I need to buy some some raw material. Um, maybe even in industrial sector, if you are Daimler, if you are BMW, you know that in a couple of months you need more steel, for example, um, and you want to hedge the risk that the price for your raw materials goes up. 
And you can do a long hedge. So the profit on loss position of a one to, and one long hedge then equals minus kt minus ks plus ft minus fs. And it's bt minus bs, again, the difference between the two bases. And before maturity may not succeed, but at the maturity date, now we have the opposite profit position. Uh, the opposite profit, that is, uh, the profit at capital T is minus bs, minus the basis at the starting point. This looks like this. Again, you go short in the um, spot position, in the underlying, and you go long in the future. Let's do what we call hedge analysis. By the way, uh, if you go back 20 years, or even 30, 40 years, there was and still is a huge literature on risk management. Risk management, from a theoretical point of view, even economists, Fauville, uh, doing research, theoretical research on risk management. And in this theoretical uh, strand of the literature, risk management is always synonymous to A, the availability of a future contract, and B, um, the question when a firm decides to buy a future and to analyze how successful is this company in using the future to hedge a short position. So these theoretical models are very simple in the sense that derivatives are reduced to just the existence of a future contract and the question when does someone in the financial market decides to buy or sell the future contract. That's equivalent and that's synonymous to risk management in financial economics. Now let's do this analysis. We want to see how successful is such an edge um, position. Um, the observed portfolio consists of n shares of a spot security of a, of a stock with price Ks. We have x futures uh, that each refer to one unit of the underlying and we can restate the profit loss position of the overall portfolio by n times the difference in the spot position minus x times the profit or loss from the futures position. So we might have 10 stocks, and the question now is, how many futures do we need? 5, 10, or 15? If we rearrange this a little bit, I've marked this in blue and red, so that you can see the difference, you see that the profit or loss is given by n times the difference in the spot prices of the stock, minus x times the difference between the futures prices, now and in the future. And if, assumably, all of these variables are stochastic, then we want to look at the expected value and the variance. Because we want to know what is the expected profit or loss, and when does this profit or loss become deterministic. It becomes deterministic when the variance is zero. Yeah? As long as the variance is, is non-zero, is, uh, is positive, then the behavior of the profit and loss function is stochastic. So let's calculate the expected profit. It's just n times the expected future spot price minus the currently known spot price minus x, the number of futures, times the expected futures price minus the already known current futures price. So Ks and Fs are not stochastic, they are deterministic. And the same with the variance of the profit, uh, yeah, of the profit function, Gt. Now, we want to reduce the risk of our position, of our portfolio. For this, we'll minimize the variance of the hedge of the hedge portfolio. So take the variance, take the first derivative of the variance with respect to x, the number of futures, because we assume that we we hold n stocks and we want to determine the number of futures we need to fully hedge our position. So it's the first derivative of the variance function with respect to x 
Very simple, that's 2x variance of ft minus 2n and the covariance between the future spot price and the future futures price. It needs to be zero for this for to be a maximum. And this shows that this optimal x, the optimal number of futures for a um, variance minimizing hedge is x star n times the covariance divided by the variance. If you have ever taken a class on corporate finance or capital market theory, you will remember this and you will recognize this, that this resembles what is usually known as a beta factor, a beta factor. It is a sensitivity of the futures price to a change in the spot price. And first, it's interesting to see that simply setting x star equal to n does not work. So 10 stocks and 10 futures will not help you to minimize the risk of this portfolio in the sense that the variance of your profits will be minimal. You need to correct for the variance and correlation between the spot and the futures price. Why is that? Empirically, you can observe that spot and futures price will vary and they will correlate. And depending on this correlation that goes into the covariance and thus into the beta factor, will result in a higher or smaller number of futures needed to hatch this portfolio. A reduction of the risk to zero is not possible and the remaining risk amounts to the variance of GT is n squared times the variance of the spot price times 1 minus the correlation between um, the spot and the futures price. Or if you take the um, square root n times the uh, volatility of the spot price and the square root of 1 minus rho squared. Now in practice um, we'll always, almost always have a positive correlation between the spot price and the futures price. If the spot price goes up, the futures price will follow. And it will not be a correlation of one, but you can assume, safely assume, that um, the correlation is non-negative. Now this means that n times sigma of kt times the square root of 1 minus rho squared, if you know that rho is larger than zero, then you have the inequality that the left-hand side is smaller than n times the volatility of the spot price. So a perfect hedge only works if the future and spot values are perfectly correlated, meaning that the future price is given by the cost of carry price. And for a hedging period of capital T, you can get a one-to-one -one perfect hedge. So then you can reduce your risk to zero. But this requires you to hold on to the future until the very end. Then you'll have a minimized risk of a risk of zero. You'll have a deterministic profit of loss of BS, of the basis. We call this ratio of X star divided by N, this beta factor, the hedge ratio. Every time we set the number of derivatives we need to hedge a certain number of n of underlyings, this ratio is called a hedge ratio. It's, it's a one-to-one -one hedge ratio, it's a two-to-one hedge ratio, and so on. And alternatively, you can also write this, this beta factor as the correlation times um, the ratio of the standard um, deviations, the volatilities of the spot and the futures price. Okay. Now let's calculate the expected value of the overall hedged position. The expected profit is n times and so on. We'll substitute this by using the beta factor and the futures price. Now we know that um, if we hold on to the futures until capital T, the expected profit is n times the basis. That is, we'll have a risk-free profit or loss 
depending on the number of underlines we have and depending on the basis uh, we had at time s. And if we now have a beta factor of 1, we have the following. The profit is given by the expected profit. It's n times the difference, again, between the futures price and the spot price minus the differences in the expected futures and spot price. Meaning that a positive basis, if the basis is positive, like say three euros, if the basis is positive and it does not widen, it does not become larger, um, it will result in a profit, whereas a negative basis that does not widen results in a loss. So it first depends on the basis, but it also depends on the question whether the basis closes or it widens. And you can see this here. This is the current basis, and this is the expected basis in the future. Hmm? Just the expected value of the futures price minus the expected value of the spot price. Okay, that's with futures. Futures are very simple. And you should remember that just by adding a future in a one-to-one -one short hedge or future uh, long hedge, you can almost perfectly hedge an existing position in an underlying. Now let's look at let us look at options. We've already talked enough about options. We know how to price them. Now let's use them for hedging. Um, we'll again have an existing underlying position. We'll start with a one-to-one -one put hedge that consists of hedging an asset position of N securities and stocks through the purchase of an equal number of puts on the same underlying. Now, what holds is the following in capital T. We'll keep and hold on to the options until the very end. We'll have the stocks. We can sell off the stocks at ST. We'll get a payout from the puts and we will have to pay a premium, the price, P0, for the options at time zero. Now, with the put, we know that the payout profile of the put is the maximum of X, the strike minus the final stock price, ST or zero. This is a European option. It's okay. Plus P0, and you can see that if you combine this, uh, your value of your portfolio will be x minus p0 or st minus p0 and this becomes more clear if you look at this plot unfortunately well, well here you can see it the stock is a linear asset the put is a non-linear asset that is what makes it so difficult to price and why we need black scores and monte carlo simulation and so on and the one-to-one -one put hedge does, now does the following. We have, I'll just use my hand. If I use my full arms, some people might think uh, I have a problem with my political ideas. Now, if this is your linear asset, your stock, what happens is the option will turn it like this, and it will bound losses at this level here. So you take, let me use some lines here. This is the linear asset of the stock. You'll have to pay a price for your hedge, that's the premium. So first of all, you will lose P0. That's the price of reducing risk. But what now happens is, at some level, your losses will be bounded below. And then you will only have this line here. And this is your payout of your combined position. And you can see this here. The difference between the linear asset, the stock, and your portfolio consisting of the stock and the put. The difference in height is just the option premium, P0. But the option gets interesting in this point here, because suddenly, if you were to lose this point here, you will get this premium and this payout because you have, uh, you have an insurance from the option contract. 
What will now follow is the idea of using not a one-to-one -one put hedge, but a one-to-two, one-to-five, and one-to-n put hedge. And what will happen is that if this was your original asset, the option will make it somewhere look like this. In the end, we will come from this to maybe this, to this, and then to such a payout profile. Je mehr Optionen Sie hin nun hinzufügen, desto stärker wird einfach das Auszahlungsprofil des Portfolios abgeknickt. Das, was Sie ganz links sehen hier, ist einfach nur die Aktie. Wenn Sie auf zwei Aktien eine Option hinzufügen, haben Sie naja, so einen leichten Knick drin. Hier haben wir jetzt den Fall eine Option, ein Underlying. Da sehen Sie direkt, es ist äh, horizontal abgeknickt. Und wenn Sie jetzt auf eine Aktie zwei Optionen packen würden, hätten Sie hier so einen Zacken. Hm? This is the profit function. You need to remember that you have to pay for the underlying as well. If you include this, your profit will be a little bit lower. Okay. The one-to-one -one put hedge results in an asymmetrical profit loss position at the end of the term. You'll hedge against declining prices, but you will also keep profiting from increasing prices, but you still need to pay the option premium. And this is the difference to a futures contract. With the option, you keep some of your opportunities and you limit some of your losses, but you can still earn money from increasing prices, for example. With a futures contract, it's just 1-1 one, one full hedge. Lose one euro, win one euro, and vice versa. With the option, is asymmetrical. Now, if you have alternative strike prices, you'll have a trade-off that takes place between an increased hedging against losses and reduced participation in gains. So with a put hedge, hedging can also take place during the maturity and during the term of the option. For example, if you take American put options, the hedge is X minus P0. For European puts, it's X times 1 plus R taking over T minus T minus P0. What are the assumptions here? You need to have an option available. You need to have the right option available, otherwise you'll have a cross-hedging risk. Um, and, of course, this is theoretical in the sense that you are formally allowed to enter the derivative positions. Now, if you go to a bank, if you go to an insurance company, and you just argue, well, why are you not buying uh, derivatives? Well, actually, that's that's one of the things that got Deutsche Bank in problems. Um, they're severely reducing their derivatives position uh, because they have billions and billions uh, of notional amounts in, in derivative contracts. And insurance companies are not allowed to engage in all types of derivative contracts because these can also be risky. A one to two hedge, put hedge, I've already described this to you. Go through the formulas and you will see this makes sense. It's just ST, one stock, plus the uh, payout of the option twice. So it's two times the maximum of and so on and so on. And you need to pay uh, two option premiums. And the result is if one stock two options, you will have this payout. You will have a larger gap between the stock and the portfolio because you now you are now paying two option prices. But instead of it looking like this, you have risk minimization here and you can even profit from very extreme drops in the underlying price. So this here, this is the combined position. This is a combined position. When, when you, do you want to use this? Well, if you think that very extreme changes are possible, extreme increases or a complete downturn of the stock price. 
then it makes sense to do a one to two put hedge. Now, two to one put hedge is the same again, just with two stocks and one put. And as I've told you, instead of having something look like this, you now have this here. A limited risk reduction, but a very small price you have to pay for the hedge. Okay. Let's look at a one-to-one -one covered short call. The one-to-one -one covered short call describes the hedging of an underlying by selling a call on this underlying. So you're using a short call, as the name suggests. Profit function of the combined portfolio is ST, we still have the underlying, but now we have the short call. We need the payout profile of the short call that is minimum of X minus ST and zero. Because we are going short in the portfolio, we will get the price of the option paid out to us at the closing of the contract. And this is minimum X ST plus C zero. So uh, this is also sometimes synonymously called a call hedge. Um, as losses and prices are only hedged up to a certain amount. Um, and this is a strategy that, that can be used in a market with low volatility. So how does this look like? We have the stock and the short call uh, is this here. And this is this here is our combined position. This is the covered short call. As you can see, you reduce the risk of losing too much money when prices go down, and you accept the fact that you will not profit too much from prices that increase too much. So in the end, you assume that prices will not change too much, so this is a market with low, hopefully a market with low volatility. That's a one-to-one. -one. Covered short call. Now let's turn to what we call a collar. A collar consists of holding the underlying, purchasing a put, and selling a call. So it's the combination of a one to one put hedge and a covered short call, a call hedge. And what happens and why is it called a collar? In the one situation, you bound your losses to the above. And reduce risk in the one-to-one -one put hedge you minimize losses when prices go down too much and the result looks like this more or less you profit from changes in between but losses are limited when prices go up or go down too much that's why it's called a collar if the price of the call and the put match. It is called a zero cost caller because then it doesn't cost you anything. What you gain with the caller, you will pay, you know, what you pay, uh, what you gain in the put, you will pay in the uh, call and vice versa. And it looks like this. Usually it will look like this. But if prices of the options match, you will have this zero price color. Meaning that, for example, if the current stock price is here, if it's here, you can still uh, um, you can earn a lot of money. You can lose as much as this here, but after that, your losses are limited. Okay. That's the profit function. It's the same, but you need to include the price of the underlying. So it's all going down by S0. Okay. You can also combine a one to one put hedge with a short call or a covered short call with a long put. And you'll get the same color, quite simple, because it's basically the same strategy. Um, 
you can see that the color limits both profits and losses. In the special case, when the two strikes, x1 and x2, uh, are equal, the final value is calculated as x minus p0 minus c0 times 1 plus r. So a risk-free position then results at optimum maturity so that for arbitrage reasons the following must apply. The value of this position is S0, the initial stock price, times 1 plus R, uh, taking over the whole maturity of the option. And this is inter interesting for the following reason, because if you now um, look at the first and the second um, equation here, if you equate both of them, you will see that C0 minus P0 is S0 minus the strike discounted with 1 plus R. And this is what we call the put-call parity, the put-call parité. It means that if you know the price of a put, you know the price of the corresponding call and vice versa. This is very, very simple relation between the call and the put of the same underlying and the same contract, of course. Okay. Now, if a held portfolio consists of different combinations of investments, uh, it can be hatched against price loss in two ways. First of all, you can purchase puts on the individual portfolio components, or you can purchase options on share indices, stock indices. Indexes. Yeah. What do you think of these strategies? Well, the first one is quite costly. If you have a portfolio and you want to hedge against the risk of this portfolio by buying individual options, you will pay transaction costs every time you buy the option. So don't do it. Or you can try to buy options on uh, indexes. Problem is that this should only work if your portfolio has a correlation of 1 or minus 1 with a corresponding stock index. Then you can buy an option or a derivative on that option, uh, on, on that stock index. If not, you'll have a hedging risk. And what you can try is a beta correction. That is, you can correct and adjust for the missing correlation between your portfolio and the stock index. And this can be done, for example, by using a beta factor between the portfolio and the index. Now let's combine options and the risk-free investment. We'll consider the combination of a risk-free uh, or a fixed interest security. And if you if you don't know this by now, fixed interest is always a bond or a zero bond. Fixed interest means that it's a security, it's an asset that pays out fixed payments, fixed interest. And a long call. So we'll have initial capital K that is invested to K1 in the safe investment and to K2 in the long call. Uh, K2 is N times C0, that uh, means we can buy N calls. The final value of the asset is given by what? K1, the investment in the risk-free rate, times 1 plus R over the remaining term, plus N options, times the payout profile of the call, that is maximum of ST minus X or 0. Now, if N puts are bought, instead the value function looks a little bit different. We will need the payout profile of the uh, put. So in both cases, your value of the portfolio is hedged downwards to K1 times 1 plus IT taking over uh, T periods. And one can also speak of so-called cash and option hedging strategies. You'll keep cash, you'll invest in cash and the option. We can also construct, and this is relevant when you do not have any matching derivatives, you can also come up with what we call synthetic puts. We'll consider a European put with the price determined according to the black scholes model. Now the delta of the put is given in the black scholes model by 
minus the value of the standard normal cumulative distribution function n at d1. And the value of the put can then be written as an investment in the amount of x times exponential function minus r times the difference in the remaining maturity times n minus d2 at the risk-free rate and a short sale of n at minus d1 shares of the underlying. And this is a synthetic put. The idea is we have a put or we want a put but we don't have a put but we know what the put pays out and we'll simply construct the payouts of this put under the black scolds uh, model by using cash and an investment and you only need to fix the amount and to calculate the amount under the black scolds model that needs to be invested in the risk-free rate at the risk-free rate and in the short sale of the underlying and the result will be a payout profile that mimics the one of a put. That's why we call it a synthetic put. It is not traded on the market, but we can simulate, we can construct the payouts of the option while using this cash and, uh, and short selling strategy. And then, of course, you can use this thin, synthetic put to do a one-to-one -one put hedge. Okay. Let's do this, a synthetic put. Let ST be the value of the portfolio to be hedged in T and PT the black skulls price of the synthetic put. Then we'll have the following. ST plus PT is ST plus the price of the black, um, of the put under black skulls model. And we'll have to change this a little bit. So it's ND1 ST plus X times the exponential function times N minus D2. And then we'll have a one to one hedge. We can also do it synthetically. So we'll have a fraction QT, N D1 times ST divided by ST plus BT. You will need to invest in the portfolio and the complement, one minus QT, is invested in the risk-free investment. However, this is always under the assumptions of the black scolds model. So if black scolds is, uh, is correct, then this is also right. If it's not, well, this strategy is not because the synthetic put will not be exactly like a put. Okay. We can combine options. Uh, we can combine the four basic positions in options um, to yield some basic trading strategies. For example, we can differentiate between vertical spreads. That is, we can use different exercise prices or we can do horizontal spreads. Uh, we can use different expiration dates using options on the same underlying. These are vertical and horizontal spreads. And then we can speculate with this. So what is a bullish call vertical spread? That's when you speculate on an increase in the underlying price. You purchase calls with a lower exercise price and you do a simultaneous sale of the same number of calls at relatively higher exercise price. The maximum profit is the difference between the exercise prices less the difference in option premiums. And the maximum loss is the difference in option, option premiums. A bearish call vertical spread is when you speculate on falling and decreasing underlying prices. And it consists of a long call with high strike price and a short call with a low strike price. So these are two spread strategies. You see options that have different expiration dates and different exercise prices, uh, different strikes, and you combine the options on the same underlying, e either with vertical spreads or horizontal spreads, and then you can speculate on increasing or decreasing um, underlying prices. Then we'll have a straddle. What is a straddle? That's a combination of puts and calls with identical exercise prices and terms. A long straddle is buying calls and puts, and a short straddle is selling calls and put, puts. So a long straddle corresponds to speculating on high price volatilities. 
and note that for a short straddle, the chance of profit is limited to the total of the option premiums at extremely decreasing or rising prices in the underlying, you may incur almost unlimited losses. Remember that with the short position, theoretically, your profit can look like this. Your profit and loss function can look like this. This is one reason why option contracts have such a bad reputation. With some option contracts, with some derivatives, you can lose all your money. And I don't mean just your investment, but I really mean all your money. You buy or sell a corresponding option. Uh, you might make a maximum profit of 100, but if the stock price just keeps on going up and going up and going up, you have an unlimited potential loss. And this is one reason why, especially financial supervisors, especially in the retail sector, financial supervisors are extremely critical of retail customers buying um, derivatives. Because with some of these contracts, you can uh, lose a lot of money. Um, have you ever heard of CFDs? Now, options and derivatives are professional securities for institutional investors. You cannot buy these as a private person. You cannot. Now, what you can buy sometimes is an option certificate, certificatsscheine. Banks will sell you uh, certificates, meaning that they mimic the payout profile of an option. Um, and what has become more and more um, popular these days are so-called CFDs, Certificates for Differences. These are certificates, we don't certificate China, that are basically the same as an option, but usually with one additional difference. First, you as a retail customer can buy it and can also go short. But do you know what one of the main differences with these certificates of differences is? They have high leverage. I can sell you an option that is uh, that pays out for every difference in the underlying price and the strike. You will get one euro for one euro difference. Or I can construct an option contract that says if the stock price is 100, if the underlying price is 99, take the difference, 1 euro, times 100, and you will get a payment of 100. So you will have a very small, uh, actually a high price for the contract, but you will have a high leverage. You only need a small increase or decrease in the underlying price to lever your profits to a high level. The problem is that you can also lose all your money in the investment quite quickly. And there used to be CFD contracts traded and offered to German customers um, that required customers to pay up all the incurred losses and the losses were unlimited. Das waren CFDs mit Nachschusspflicht. Und wenn sie da eingestiegen sind und keine Ahnung hatten, dann war ihr Eigenheim weg. Dann konnten sie anfangen, auf der Straße zu leben. For this reason, BaFin, uh, for the very first time in Germany, used its uh, executive power to ban certain financial products. And CFDs with unlimited loss potential are now banned in Germany. Uh, you can imagine why these are, at least to me, they are marketed via YouTube uh, ads uh, that are in English and where you can see that all those custom, uh, those companies uh, are located on Jersey, Guernsey, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, and so on. Uh, those are those are the bad boys in this market. They are only out to um, to scam you of your money. It's 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 pure speculation, and if you don't have any knowledge of financial markets, you can lose a lot of money. By the way, this is quite interesting. Um, I recently heard of uh, a lawsuit, of a criminal law, uh, criminal lawsuit, 
um, that is based on exactly this type of um, behavior and this marketing of option and derivative contracts to customers. And it's a very difficult question where uh, it's, it's the risk of the investor and where fraud starts. And in this case, I heard of, um, this was very interesting. Uh, there was a company, or a number of persons, that almost 10 years ago marketed these option contracts to private persons in Germany. Um, some of those investors made a profit in the first round, and almost all of the options were deeply out of the money, and in the end, this company and these investors they raked in, I think, 50 or 60 million euros from private investors. They themselves took in 14 millions in uh, provisions, in fees. Not a single investor ever made one euro in profits. 50, 60 million eingenommen. Nominalbetrag, Nominalvolumen an Investoren verkauft, Privatpersonen wohlgemerkt. 14 Millionen Provision eingestrichen. Kein einziger hat jemals überhaupt mit einem, einer dieser Optionen Gewinn erzielt. Ergebnis ist natürlich ein Strafverfahren während, wegen Betruges. Und das bei der Summe natürlich, dass Sie wahrscheinlich davon ausgehen können, da gehen Sie nicht nur für ein paar Monate in den Knast. Schwierigkeit bei der Frage ist, wo fängt, wo fängt der Betrug an? Ich weiß, in den Verfahren, das, das läuft aktuell noch, ist auch öffentlich, können Sie ja mal suchen, ob Sie es finden. In den Verfahren ist die schwierige Frage, äh, nicht die Beweislast, äh, konnten, diese, äh, konnten diese Leute das wissen, dass die Optionen, die sie verkauft haben, dass die nie im Leben Gewinne abwerfen würden. Und die waren so weit aus dem Geld, dass da natürlich dann auch Gutachter gesagt haben, also die Chance, da überhaupt irgendwann mal bei irgendeiner dieser Optionskontrakte da auch nur ein Euro zu, zu gewinnen, ist so niedrig gewesen, dass das natürlich dann schon Betrug sein muss, wenn man von 64 oder 50 oder 60 Millionen, 14 Millionen Euro Gebühren abzwackt. Ne? Ja. Und deswegen, CFDs sind mein persönlicher, äh, mein persönlicher Liebling. Ja, die, die glauben gar nicht, wie oft YouTube äh, mir versucht, irgendwie CFDs anzudrehen. Ja? Trading, Trading, Trading. Gut. Short Straddle. Coming back to option strategies, that's a short straddle. A short put combined with a short call. And you can see here, this is the short straddle. Strangle goes on and on. We have a lot of different option strategies. Combination of puts and calls with different exercise prices, but the same maturity. A long straddle, buying calls and short uh, puts. Short straddle, selling calls and puts. A long straddle is when the loss is limited to the total of the option premium paid, and you have almost unlimited profit opportunities with sharply falling or rising prices in the underlying and the opposite with a short straddle, a strangle. And a variation of the strangle as well as straddle positions is achieved by combining different numbers of calls and puts. And then we'll have a long strip and a long strap strategy. Let's see this here. This is a long straddle. So in contrast to a straddle that looks like this, this is a strangle or rather here. Now, let's vary this. Um, we'll purchase a call option with a low strike price and we'll purchase a put option with a high strike price. Then again, we'll have a long strangle that is right here. This is the long strangle. And obviously, if you vary the number of options you are buying or selling, you can change it a little bit. You can increase your profit, but also your loss positions. 
and then we'll have a long strip. Two puts with the same exercise price and same maturity are purchased for each long call. And it looks like this. That's the long strip. It's, rather, it's a little bit more extreme. Long strap, two calls, same thing. Now it looks like this. And last but not least, a butterfly spread. Um, this is a strategy at which, uh, in which the wings of a straddle are limited by additional options. We want to limit the loss potential, so we'll buy two calls. We'll short sell two calls. The first call is bought in the money and the second call is bought out of the money. An addition two calls are sold at the current price and that's a long butterfly. And the aim is to generate premium income. That's a butterfly spread. I doubt that most banks and insurance companies will ever use these elaborate strategies, but of course portfolio and investment managers will do. Uh, if you need to come up with um, these elaborate option strategies, well, then investment managers will do this. Um, these are simple combinations of options. What you can now do is you can enter financial engineering. Financial engineering means that you have these strategies and an investment bank comes up and combines these strategies in a new security for example, in a discount certificate. Now, these are structured products. Some investor asks another investor, usually an investment bank, can you sell or buy this type of product? Can you structure this? The investment bank will do this, and then the result is a new financially engineered security, and we'll first discuss a discount certificate. A discount certificate is what? The holder of the discount certificate receives the value of a fixed number of shares at maturity. However, the payment is limited to a maximum amount of C, that's the so-called cap, per share. And the value of the structured product is thus systematically below the value of the share. This is why it's called a discount certificate. It, it's, it, it sells as a, at a discount. And then it follows that the value of this discount certificate is N, times the minimum of ST minus or C, then it's N times ST plus the minimum of C minus ST and zero, or N times ST minus the maximum of C minus ST and zero. And you can see this again resembles an option strategy, but the strike price is now taken to be the final underlying price ST. Duplication therefore takes place using stocks and a short call on these stocks and the discount certificate thus securitizes a covered short call. And this is why it's called structured product and mm, in the end financial engineering. You take a strategy that includes several securities and if you turn it into a new combined security that is financial engineering, you are creating something new and it's a new security and this is why the discount certificate securitizes a covered short call. As a as discount, discount certificate does um, verbrieft den covered short call. Wenn Sie also einen covered short call brauchen, können Sie es entweder selber machen oder Sie schauen nach so einem discount certificate. Good. Then we'll have guarantee certificates. With a guarantee certificate, the buyer receives the underlying at the maturity, provided that the underlying price is above a fixed guaranteed amount. So the payout is the maximum of ST minus G or zero. That again is ST plus maximum of G minus ST zero. Again, we see that the second part of this equation is an option and it duplicates the underlying and a long put. That's a guarantee. Equity linked bond. In the case of an equity linked bond, the issue of the bond can repay either the nominal value, N, or a predetermined amount of a also predetermined stock of maturity. 
at maturity. In contrast to the convertible bond, the issuer thus has a conversion right, hence the term reverse convertible bond. What does it mean? What is a convertible bond? What is the German word for convertible bond? What is a convertible bond? Was heißt das auf Deutsch? Es ist eine Wandelanleihe. Was passiert bei einer Wandelanleihe? Wer weiß das? Bei einer Wandelanleihe kaufen Sie eine Anleihe und Sie als Investor haben hinterher die Wahl, ob Sie sagen, Sie wollen Ihr Geld zurück über die Anleihe oder Sie wollen Ihr Geld ausgezahlt haben in einer festgelegten Anzahl an Aktien. Und Sie wählen natürlich das, was für Sie vorteilhafter ist. Entweder Sie nehmen Ihr Geld zurück oder Sie holen sich die Aktien und die können Sie natürlich dann wieder verkaufen. Hier ist es aber so, ähm, bei dem Equity Link Bond ist es umgekehrt. Der Emittent kann sich aussuchen, ob er lieber das Geld zurückzahlt oder ob er lieber Aktien ausgibt. Deswegen nennt man es auch Reversible, Re Reverse Convertible Bond. Cashflows from the bond are then given by Z, 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 Z plus the minimum of N or N times ST. I'm either repaying the bond, notional N, or I'm paying out N stocks with the price ST. We divide this into its components N plus the minimum of N plus N times the minimum of N minus N times the maximum of and so on. And in the end, you can see that this is what? Z, 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 Z plus N, that's the bond, minus N times the maximum of N over N minus ST or zero. So it's a regular bond with coupon Z, no? Z, Z, Z plus N, ist ja nichts anderes als eine Couponanleihe mit Couponzahlung mit Verzinsung Z und Nominalbetrag N and a short put on the share. And we are at the end. What you see at the end here is something you will see a lot in financial economics. Options are quite versatile in the sense that they can be used to describe any option you have. I'll give you a very extreme and very, very uh, vivid example. You have the option um, to go out and eat a steak or you don't. The steak will give you a utility or you will not. You will have a strike, you will have to pay something for that. That also gives you a utility. But depending on your hunger, the volatility of the stake may be higher or lower. So you have, a ink, you have an underline, you have a utility, you have a strike, and you can calculate the value of this option. Now let's make a more realistic example. You have a gas power plant. You can fire up your power plant and produce electricity. However, firing up a gas power plant, firing up the machines, is costly. You cannot simply turn the power plant on and off for no cost. It needs some time to power up, even more with a nuclear power plant, and there are some fixed costs in uh, running a power plant. And if you have some cost, that's your strike. And if you can sell at a higher price, if the price of electricity goes up, then you will make a profit revenues from electricity minus the costs or your alternative is don't start the power plant. So this is what later on we'll call a real option and a real option. Any decision you have in economics can usually be modeled as an option contract. And if you know this, in any model in economics or financial economics, Well, you can now say, well, if this is an option, if I have the option that I can go out and eat a steak, you have to pay a price for it, but you get some utility, you can use Black Scholes model and calculate the value of that option. You can use Black Scholes and calculate the value of a power plant. 
and so on. And this is done in practice in industry. And the last example I give you is, um, I told you that this is why the black scolds model should be called black scolds merton If you take a firm, if you take any firm, the firm has a value of its assets and its liabilities, an Unternehmenswert, say 1 billion euros. The company, the firm, also has liabilities, also has debt, Fremdkapital, Schulden. So what is paid out to equity holders if the company is liquidated? If the company has 1 billion in assets and it has 500 million in debt, you first need to pay out your money to your debt holders, to your debtors. They get 500 million, you will have a residual value of 500 million, and only these 500 residual millions will go to shareholders. So what is the position of a shareholder? It's assets minus debt, or in case you do not have enough assets, you will pay 300 millions to your debt holders, Nothing remains, but the shareholders will not have to pay up. They will simply say, okay, I'm sorry, our stocks are worthless, but my liability is limited. That's one of the perks of having a share. You do not have to pay up when the company runs out of money. So what is the position of an equity holder or the shareholder? A minus D or zero, and it's the maximum of the two. And that's exactly what... That's a call option on the asset value of the firm with debt as the strike. That was Merton's idea to model the value of equity and the value of debt as an option contract, as a call or a put, on the firm value using debt as a strike. And every time you have a more complicated model in financial economics of firm value, of default probability, you can assume that almost everything in credit risk management, in credit risk, is based on this idea that default bankruptcy takes place if the option expires and the option is worthless. Um, you can take this option framework and use it to calculate default probabilities and firm values and to price a firm. And it's the same here. You're using the option pricing framework to price anything that resembles an option. Now, this is why it's so important in finance. Okay. Any questions before we stop here for the last time? On any topic in the uh, lecture? Okay. So if you don't have any questions, good luck with the exam. Again, the exam will be in English. You can answer in English or German. You shouldn't mix English and German too much in the, in the exam. If you don't know uh, a vocabulary, uh, you can, of course, use the German word if, if you know the German word only. But uh, don't switch back and forth between English and German all the time during the exam. Okay, so good luck with the exams. Have a great time after the exams and the vacation and maybe see you next semester. Thank you.